نحمد ونسلی علیہ رسول الکریم اما بعد فاعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم جنٹل مین اٹ گیوز می گریٹ پلیجر ٹو بی امنگسٹ یو اینڈ وی گیون دی اپرچونیٹی ٹو ڈسکس سم آف دی آئیڈیاز آف آر اپروچ ان انڈرسٹینڈنگ دا قرآن وی ہیو بین ریڈنگ دا قرآن ایور سنس آل آف اس ہیو گرون اپ ان ویریس انوائرمنٹس اینڈ ایچ ون آف اس ہیز ہز اور ہر اون شیئر آف کویشچنس ریگارڈنگ دا قرآن But as a teacher, I have been particularly concerned about the next generation who is springing up all over the world, and they have a lot of, lot of questions regarding the Qur'an. And in fact, I have found young ones approach me in their teens and uh, telling me in secret and in a slightly whispering mode that, uh, frankly, they don't understand the Qur'an, the relevance of the Qur'an, or how the Qur'an actually relates to them in their lives today. A lot of the Qur'an deals with stories of the past, so many things which seemingly to them uh, do not relate, they become obsolete to them. So the young mind uh, is puzzled, it's not that they are drawn away from the Qur'an, it only seems that a proper introduction to the Qur'an uh, needs to be given before they actually start reading the Qur'an. And I have actually been working on this and uh, uh, ever since uh, this problem was diagnosed many years ago, Uh, what we have done is we've tried, we've tried to actually come up with a short introduction to the Qur'an for the young ones as well as for people who'd like to know how the Qur'an speaks to us and how it is relevant to us and what are the basic background features of the Qur'an that all of us need to know uh, when we study the Qur'an. And this is also true for people who would like to study Islam for the first time. maybe who are not yet Muslims and they'd like to know what the Qur'an tells them. So it's not a good idea to hand them over the Qur'an uh, without actually introducing them what the book is about. So it's like a background check on the book that you'd like to introduce to other people. So uh, whenever we study physics or chemistry or any other science subject or any other social science subject, what generally we do is we always have an introduction to that subject first before we start studying any text. It makes much more sense, it makes much more uh, pleasurable reading if we are able to gauge what the book is all about. So today I do plan in a very short space, of course this needs uh, some more lectures, but I'll try to summarize uh, some of the major areas which as Muslims and as people would like to study the Quran, uh, to have a basic introduction of the Quran, we should have that idea, we should have that uh, background knowledge so that whenever we pick up the Qur'an the next time, even whilst reading it with a good translation, it makes much more sense uh, to us and it, we connect to it much, in a much more vibrant way than we normally do by just picking up the translation and at times lulling those questions to sleep that might arise in our minds simply because we think that uh, being believers and being people who have been uh, uh, brought up as Muslims All that we need to do is just to read through the Qur'an and even if we have questions or issues of relevancy or irrelevancy, uh, what difference does it make as long as we have this belief that the Qur'an is the book of God and all that we need to do is to just, just read it with a good translation and perhaps follow it to the best of our ability. But as I said, that it's like a very, a rudic, very rudimentary example to you would be that if you do not understand poetry and you are translated a particular poem, Although the effect is still there, but the, if had you known the original language and the way that poetry speaks to you, uh, you would have had that extra effect. It would have had an extra effect on your soul that you just don't derive directed from it. You also derive the urge to follow that. So the thing which, which misses out uh, in this uh, whole exercise is that a plain translation can tell you what God wants from you. But the, the effect which, which a Uh, person can have on himself or herself if he or she is able to directly understand the Quran and also some of the nuances, some of the subtleties that are uh, with the Quran and which are specific to the Quran because the Quran is a unique book. It's a book that we are not very, very uh, used to. Uh, the books that we are used to are books which have headings, they have chapters, uh, they have subheadings, they have paragraphs, they have a lot of things. And the introduction uh, to any book, of course, is the foreword or the preface of that particular book. So we are used to books in the human plane in which the book that we call Quran is, is, is entirely different. So hence it becomes even more, more essential and even more 
uh, necessary that we have that basic introduction. So uh, having said these uh, basic introduction, introductory remarks, I'd like now shift my, my talk towards some of these basic uh, issues which must be understood by all serious students of the Quran, all serious people who'd like to know that why is this Quran uh, such a glorious word of God and at times when you pick up the word of God, it's like an anticlimax. Uh, if I reflect uh, and uh, speak out to you some of the words and minds of my own students and some of the people that I know, that if they don't, they don't look at the Quran with aqidat and with that believer sort of a eye, the, the thing that comes to them is that is, has to be explained in the current idiom and in a, in a way that uh, it really makes sense to all of us. So the first thing that, we, that all of us need to know is the genre of the Quran. What exactly is the Quran? Is it a book of poetry? Is, a, is it a book of prose? Is it a book of history? Is it a book of science? Is it a book of quotations? So there are a number of genres that exist in contemporary literature. And because of the fact that Quran is a piece of literature, we have to have the first hand introduction as far as the genre of the Quran is concerned. And as far as the genre of the Quran is concerned, a simple reading uh, of the Quran will tell you that the closest example that we can give about the Quran is that it's a book of dialogues. It's a book of a conversation between people who existed in times of the 7th century Arabia. And the word qala yaqulu or ya yuhallazina, all these invocatives or these uh, uh, past tense verbs or uh, indefinite tense verbs tells, uh, tell us that basically there's some sort of conversation going on between people and that conversation uh, if it can be closely uh, followed and closely understood, uh, the best name that we can give that genre is that it's a book of dialogues, much like on a very rudimentary uh, level, much like the dialogues of Plato or maybe the works of Shakespeare or the Divine Com Comedy of Dante, the famous Italian poet, or the Javid Nama of Sir Muhammad Iqbal. So if we have studied these literary works, you'll find out that there is a conversation going on between various entities which exist in that particular book. And that is precisely what the Quran is also very, very worthy of. So you see the characters which occur in the Quran. I'm just trying to make it simple so that you can bring the book of God to a slightly more human plane, in a slightly more human plane, in order to make it more comprehensible and understandable to people like us, like we earthlings. So uh, if you pick up a book of uh, plays or maybe uh, like the plays of Shakespeare or as I said, uh, the Javed Nama of Iqbal, you'll find that there is an introduction in the beginning which tells us what are the characters which speak in this particular play or, or book of dialogues and typically the names would be written. So if I adopt a very similar format, I would say the characters which feature in this book are God himself, is God himself, the prophets of God, Satan, he speaks in, in, the, in the Quran, and we have uh, believers, we have the people of the book, we have the hypocrites. So these are the main people who actually speak to one another. And when I say they speak to one another, uh, as I said, at times this speech is very subtle. So at times I would be speaking to you and my conversation would, would actually be directed to someone else because I, I'd like to make it more indirect. And the more indirect a certain uh, intent becomes, the more direct actually it is felt by the other person. Because if you talk directly to certain entities, uh, it becomes much more blatant. And when the purpose is to make it more subtle, what you do is you don't address that entity directly. You address someone else and the direction of that address is actually to that entity. And that entity actually understands it very well as we do in our own conversation. So if you have to look at the Quran, you can look at the way, for example, the people who are sitting in this room, when we talk to each other, the way we converse with each other, the things that we at times omit and leave them to be understood. At times we speak in a sort of a monologue. At times our speech is directed uh, simultaneously towards more than one entity. For example, if, uh, like Imam Farahi, one of the premier scholars of uh, Quran in the subcontinent once said, that the Quran is a khatiban samawiyan. It's like he's like a divine sermonizer who speaks to multiple addresses. So it would be speaking to the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims simultaneously. And what would happen is that because of the fact that it would be speaking to one entity and then shifting that address to the other entity, the reader, if 
is not aware of this shift would regard this, this jump or this leap to be a disjointed sort of a thing. And often we do come across uh, the Quran if we read it uh, very uh, deeply and in a very intricate way. It does bother and puzzle us that why is it that a certain subject is discussed and suddenly something new is discussed and apparently there's not a connection between what is discussed later on and what was just being discussed formally. So this disjointedness and this leap can be explained on many occasions in the Quran if we just think that it is addressing multiple addressees at the same time. So for example, when I'm addressing one addressee, they could be the people of the book, they have their own beliefs. And when I shift to the Muslims, of course, they have their own beliefs. That shift can be accounted for if we know that two particular entities are being simultaneously conversed with. However, if I don't have this background, I would, I would have this question in mind. Why is it that at one time one thing has been discussed and without any reason or any connection, another thing is brought up? So that actually also solves this riddle of disjointedness at many places. Of course, there are certain other subtleties in the Arabic language, but many a time these subtleties are because of the fact that we don't gauge that the Quran is just discussing multiple entities and multiple addresses at the same time. So uh, if we keep this dialogue nature of the Quran in our mind, uh, there are certain things that, that spring forth as a result. Uh, and I'd just like to enumerate those couple of things in a few points. First, whenever you pick up the Quran and start reading a surah, ask yourself, who is speaking to whom? Who is the addresser? Who is speaking? And to whom is that discourse being addressed? And that will give you an idea that at times it's not just a simple reading in which God is always speaking. Because of course God is the author of the Quran, but besides being an author, he has used various characters within the, within the Quran who deliver their own speeches. So when you are more careful in studying the Quran, every time that you pick up a Quranic verse and see that who is the addressee and who is the speaker, you'll actually have an, an entirely different view of the Quran. And just to give you a, maybe an example of uh, in the human sphere, uh, so if, for example, if you p uh, pick up Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, a very famous play, and you'll find uh, Portia speaking, you'll find Brutus speaking, you'll find Caesar himself, you'll find Scatius. So their names would be written on the, on the left side and typically there will be a colon, and then whatever they utter is written right in front of it. This, this is a very basic structure of every book of dialogues. But in the Quran, the only thing missing is this name and the colon. So maybe if you practice a Quranic surah and pick up a Quranic surah and ask yourself that which, are the, which is the verse which is speaking to a particular person, you can write that, that entity on the left-hand side, put a colon and see who, which verse is actually directed to which person. And this address changes also. So it's not that when the Almighty starts off with the speaker, the speaker does not change. The speaker and the spoken to, they continuously change. So as you read a shorter surah of the Quran, it's, it's a good exercise to do. Just pick up the Quran, pick a shorter surah of the Quran and analyze who is speaking to whom. And whenever that shift takes place, just mark that. If you have a, if you have a computer, of course, it's very easy. You have the Arabic text or the English text uh, in word format. You can just divide that and tell yourself, okay, this is the part which is being addressed to a specific entity. And from here onwards, it's, it changes and it switches. And let me tell you, when you start doing that, you'll discover a new Quran. You'll find out your own personal interest so catchy. It's, 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 it's so, your, your attention is caught so much that you literally start analyzing that what exactly is the whole scenario about. So the, these two points are are basic offshoots of this genre of the Quran that first analyze who is speaking to whom and second always pay attention to this change in address which takes place very frequently in the Quran. So for example Surah Fatiha, just pick up Surah Fatiha and you'll see that Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim these are verses that, are, that come out from a human mind and they address God. So a very simple reading would tell us that the whole of Surah Fatiha comes out from the human mind. So the speaker is a human being and the spoken to is God. Because in most du'as, in most supplications, it is like this, that the speaker is always a human person and the spoken to, of course, is the Almighty. So, so on and so forth. The third point that needs to be uh, perhaps kept in mind when you study this dialogue nature of the Quran is that uh, a lot of things which, are, which occur in the Quran have a very local or a localized uh, appeal. Thus, for example, uh, characters 
which do not exist in 7th century Arabia will never be brought up in the Quran. So I have many friends, uh, Hindus and maybe uh, some other denominations who often ask this question that why is it that the Quran does not speak of two very major religions of the world that one is Buddhism and the other is Hinduism and they are of course they occupy a very vast uh, area on the globe. So the answer is very simple. Buddhism and Hinduism never existed in Arabia of those times. So when you talk about certain things, it's not that the Quran is an all-embracing book, although the principles, of course, are all-embracing, but the people who are, uh, are uh, invected in the Quran as characters, they are the ones who, which are real-time characters, which existed in Arabia. So if you ask a person that why is it that Shintoism or Buddhism or Jainism or some of the other religions are not reflected in the Quran, the simple answer is because the Quran was revealed to people and towards those uh, entities which existed in 7th century Arabia because the dialogue actually took place between them. The conversation took place between them. So if you have this inkling of uh, the fact that the Quran is a, is a dialogue, then the dialogue has to be between real entities. It cannot be an imaginary sort of a dialogue. And the fourth thing, uh, which is also a result of this dialogue nature of the Quran is that there are certain things which uh, at times don't make sense to us because they deal with the beliefs of the times of those people. Thus, for example, this is a very common question which our uh, Christians and Jews uh, often ask and that is that uh, why is it that two-thirds of the Quran deals with the idolaters, it deals with idolatry and uh, whenever we pick up the Quran, the Almighty is seemingly very angry with people who have, have taken up polytheism or idolatry. And because of the fact that these Abrahamic religions, Jews and Christians, they, they are basically standing in the background of monotheism. They are basically monotheistic religions. For, to them, two-thirds of the Quran uh, makes little sense because uh, they would ask that why is it that we are being told these things, whereas, of course, we, we believe in one God. We don't associate with him. So if they are made to be aware of this fact that the Quran's addresses in the times in which it was revealed were... Two-thirds of the Quran is about the idolaters because of the fact that they were in abundance in Arabia and because of the fact that they were the, the, the nation towards whom the Prophet was actually sent. He was born among them. So a major part of the Quran deals with their beliefs. It deals the way they looked at things. And just to give you another example, look at the Jews of the times of the Prophets of Arabia. So one particular thing separated them from the mainstream Jews and that was they regarded Ezra or Uzair, as the Quran says, to be the son of God. Now, many Jews object to this claim and say that why is it that uh, we don't believe in a son of God? We are pure monotheists. So it is for this particular aspect that we tell them that the Jews of Arabia were slightly different in their beliefs from the mainstream Jews. And one of these differences was that they believed Ezra or Uzair to be the son of God. Again, that's a localized belief. It's not, an, it's not a universal Jewish belief. So. This again is the result of the fact that the speaker and the spoken to, the entities which are speak, spoken to, are those entities which existed in the times of Arabia. So this particular objection of the Quran, that is, it wrongly attributes to the Jews that they also committed the same form of polytheism as the Christians did, is actually not correct because of the fact that we need to understand that mainstream Jews, which belong not to Arabia, had a different sort of an outlook. So the first, this is the first point that I've tried to make, that we have to understand this very important area of the Quran, that it's a book of dialogues, it's a book that was revealed between uh, the 6th and 7th centuries towards people who existed, and this dialogue is a structured conversation which takes place between entities, and of course, uh, the, as a result of this dialogue, we are able to gauge some principles which can be applied to the rest of the world which did, did not exist in the times of the Prophet, but we need to understand that they are basically principles and the application is, is a human endeavor. So although there were certain, uh, certain principles or certain uh, parts of the conversation which directly made their impact on the people of those times, but a lot of them don't exist today. Thus, for example, as I just show you, that the Jews and Christians of the times of the Prophet in some other aspects also are not the same Jews and Christians that we have today. They are entirely different lot. And that's my next, next part of my conversation actually is now going to deal with some of the areas that again need our uh, attention. And I'd call that particular uh, area as to understand the theme of the Quran. What exactly is the theme of the Quran? So the first part of my conversation related to the yonder of the Quran, 
uh, what type of the Quran, is it a book of dialogues or a book of history, or etc. So in our humble research, it's a book of conversation and dialogues between real life entities of 7th century Arabia. Next comes the theme of the Quran. Now what exactly is the theme of the Quran? Because uh, it has been regarded to have a very uh, wide theme. Thus, for example, there are scholars who say that the theme of the Quran is, is man, is the world. And when they say these words, they actually try to point out at the all-embracing nature of the Quranic guidance, that it, it takes into account everything. There's nothing which you cannot find in the Quran. Every knowledge, every discipline, everything that comes to your mind exists in the Quran. This is how people generally introduce the Quran. But to be frank and to be honest, is this really the case? It is not. Of course, so we need to understand that the Quran has a specific import. It has a very specific theme. And that theme has to be understood if we have to understand the Quran again. So, in order to explain to you the uh, theme of the Quran, uh, let me give you this hypothetical or a, or a real life example in which if I draw a timeline, it's like a timeline starting from Prophet Adam and stretching all the way to the Day of Judgment. So it's like a timeline of this world. So I would say that if point zero is the time where, for example, the prophet Adam was injected or inducted on the planet Earth, and the last end of this line is the day on which everything will be destroyed and the day of judgment will come into being. So on that line, uh, the, the religious history of mankind, I'm talking about the religious history, not the other type of history, we can divide the, the religious history of mankind into two parts. The first part, which started with Adam and ended on Muhammad is called the prophetic period, in which prophets of God came, in which the Almighty directly interacted with human beings through his prophets, sent books, guidances, and the uh, works of the angels were much more palpable than they are today. And then there's a second period, uh, which starts from the demise of Prophet Muhammad and ends and goes all the way up to the Day of Judgment. So if you can divide this, you'll find that the first period occupies a very long time. I mean, if it's 7,000 years or 8,000 years, the, there is a, a huge amount of discrepancy as to when Adam existed and when uh, actually this first prophetic period ended. But whatever that, it's much longer in extent to the extent in which we are living today, the post-prophetic period, but because that's just about 1,500 years old, when, till, till now. Of course, it can stretch uh, to God knows what time. But the first period is the period in which the Almighty sent prophets and the second period is the one when he no longer sends prophets and the guidance that he has given us in the form of books, of his own books, it's, they are preserved for us to be guided from. So in this particular first period, uh, which we call the prophetic period, there is a specific feature which is very, very specific to that period and which cannot be stretched in the second period. And it is by not understanding that particular aspect that we have actually at times come to a lot of erroneous conclusions regarding what the Quran says, regarding especially Jews and Christians or non-Muslims of its own times. So in this particular first period, what the Almighty did was, in the, in the times of his messengers, he sent those messengers. Those messengers were given this authority to speak the truth on his behalf uh, and conclusively deliver the truth. When I say conclusively, it means that they are left with no excuse to deny the truth. So in the times of the, the first period, which is the prophetic period, there is a feature which is common to all, almost all messengers of God, and that is that the day of judgment, which is that, that third period after the day of judgment, in which reward and punishment are going to take place in the hereafter, that reward and punishment, so that we don't forget that reward and punishment, that is actually given empirical evidence in that first prophetic period, such that in the life of each of these messengers of God, they punish people, they reward people through on behalf of the Almighty, just to remind uh, all other people that the day of judgment is going to come one day. Today we are making this smaller judgment against you so as to remind you that one day that greater judgment is going to take place. So this feature of the first prophetic period is specific to the messengers of God. They are given this authority to punish people and they are also given this authority that if they are not in a, in, a, in, in a certain quantity, then the Almighty himself punishes those people through natural disasters. 
Thus, for example, the Aad and the Samud and, and other nations were destroyed by the Almighty when they intentionally denied the truth. So this first period of, of uh, the Quran, of, 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 of this Muslim, or I can say the world religious history, is a period in which the Almighty punishes people for their deliberate denial. In the next period, which is the post-prophetic period, from the Prophet Muhammad until the Day of Judgment, this no longer is the case. Punishment at the hands of the believers does not, no longer takes place because uh, prophets of God, they are in fact representatives of God. And because they are representatives of God, they are authorized to do certain things which normal believers are not. In the times of the prophets of God, which is the prophetic period, the Almighty delivers the truth through these prophets and he tells the, his own prophets that which of the people amongst his addressees are intentionally denying, deliberately denying, and hence they are punished for their deliberate denial. In the post-prophetic period, this deliberate denial cannot be judged because you see, deliberate denial is something which relates to your own heart. It's in your own intention and only the Almighty could have divulged that deliberate uh, denial and he, he did not do so, he did not choose to do so. So we need to understand that the Jews and the Christians of the times of the Prophet who had intentionally denied were punished by God or through the prophets of God at the behest of God because of the fact that the information of this deliberate denial was made available to the prophets of God and they were told that they'll be punished because of the fact that uh, they, ha they were left with no excuse. After this period, the post-prophetic period, the period in which we are existing, we, cannot, we can never see or in the first place we are ourselves no, not prophets of God. So the, the extent of truth or the extent of preaching that can be done by us of course is much lesser in extent to what prophets of God could have done. And, this, and the second thing is that in this particular period we can never be sure whether we have actually delivered the truth in its ultimate form because that only a prophet of God can do. And also we can never be sure if a person has fully understood and then he is or she is denying something in spite of full understanding. So this post-prophetic period drastically changes the whole situation. In the prophetic period, the period in which the Quran was revealed, we find the Almighty giving directives to chop off the heads of the, of the non-believers. He gives directives to not, not make friends with these disbelievers. He tells us not to pray for the forgiveness of these, uh, these disbelievers. Why? Because these were those Jews and Christians and idolaters who had basically denied the truth, denied the Almighty Himself, not because of any confusion, not because of any reservation, but because they were convinced and they, out of arrogance they denied. And the punishment that was meted out to them in various forms, as I said, like killing them or waging jihad against them uh, in certain instances, or as I said, cutting off ties of friendship with them, related to, to these sorts of Jews and Christians. In the post-prophetic period, the Jews and Christians and the non-Muslims which exist today, as I said, if we understand this basic principle, they are an entirely different lot. And the punishments or the harsh words or the harsh areas of the Quran, which were specifically meant for the Jews and Christians and the directors of the times of the, of the era of the prophets of God, were specific. And if I go on a little and, let, uh, and perhaps also comment on this, uh, the current situation, uh, I would say that people like Mullah Omar, Osama bin Laden and many other people who have arisen are the ones who have actually misunderstood this practice of the Almighty in which this punishment of the disbelievers took place by the prophets of God. And because they thought that the prophets of God are some people whom we must follow in letter and spirit. So without realizing the fact that this is something which, which was specific to the prophets of God. It was a law which was meant for the prophets of God because they speak on behalf of God. It's not something that we can do. So what they did was that practices which were specific or the law which was specific to the, to the, to the uh, era of the prophets, they were guilty of perhaps misreading this practice and they, as I uh, often say, were guilty of playing God. So God played his role in the prophetic era directly through his prophets. He chose not to do so in the post-prophetic era. But because we, most of us could not understand this distinction, we continued to actually extend that prophetic era and we still continue to do it even today. And we think that just as prophets of God are authorized uh, to punish people uh, on behalf of God, we too have the same distinction. So, Summing up, I can say that the theme of the Quran, which of course was the topic that I, I wanted to uh, have a pointer at, was that it is basically a, a, a saga 
or a story of the prophets of God, the way, and in particular the prophet Muhammad, the way he delivered the truth in his times and the way when people denied him, they were punished or rewarded, vice versa. So this is the theme of the Quran. And when you understand this theme of the Quran, you are able to gauge the fact that this theme is something which embraces the whole of the Quran while making this distinction that the, the non-Muslims of the times of the Prophet were, of course, a, a very specific entity and they were dealt with in a very severe way by the Almighty. But in the post-prophetic period, this, cannot, this can no longer take place because of the fact that the Quran is preserving its theme in its, in its prophetic era. So the theme of the Quran is, of course, that whole uh, era of the Prophet in which he delivered his warning. Now, the question which naturally arises, I, I, can, I can, of course, gauge from your faces that the question that, that can naturally arise is that then why, then what is the relevance of this, is this whole exercise? Because if we say that a lot of the Quran is, uh, deals with the, 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 with the Jews and Christians and the non-Muslims of the times of the Prophet himself, then how, how do we relate to the Quran? Because if, the, if today's non-Muslims are not the same non-Muslims of the times of the Prophet, then how can we be guided from the Quran? So, the answer to this question, and it's a very relevant and a very pertinent question, is that remember the basic thing which the Almighty wants us never to forget is the accountability of the hereafter. So, in the Quran, he has preserved the greatest argument of the fact that the accountability in the hereafter is going to take place. We, you see, the Almighty wants us to be continuously reminded of the fact that, wake up, you will be held accountable in this world. If not in this world, then at least you will be held accountable in the hereafter. And the biggest proof of that accountability is that mini accountability which took place in the era of the prophets. So the relevance is that when we read the Quran and we find out that people were held accountable in this world, the purpose is for the Almighty to remind us that if our own accountability has been delayed, it does not occur in our own, in our own lifetimes. Don't think that it will never occur. It's going to occur, but on the day of judgment. So for us, the Quran gives us this continuous message that wake up. Beware that if like the, the, the nations of the prophets of God who were held accountable in this world, if you people are not being held accountable in this world, then don't get deceived. That pattern is going to be followed. The only difference is those people were held accountable and rewarded and punished in this world and you shall be done in the next world. So the Quran is continuous, continuously sounding us this reminder that this is how we have to lead our lives. You must never forget that this accountability is something which is going to elude us if we are not being held accountable in this, in this life of the world. So this is the second point that I wanted to make and this actually makes a world of difference when you read the Quran. And when you hand over the Quran to a, maybe a non-Muslim or maybe to your young teenager, son or daughter, you tell them that the harsh verses of the Quran, the verses of the Quran, which actually deal uh, with a lot of uh, bloodshed and a lot of carnage, are the ones directed at people who have intentionally, deliberately, out of no, excuse, no, no, per, uh, no logical pretext denied. They have nothing to say except the fact that it was arrogance that, that led them to deny. And we have to be beware that we don't also we don't follow their their uh, path. So this is this introduction also tells us. Uh, so I'm not trying to sort of simplify or uh, tone down the harshness of the Quran. Of course, that would be something very uh, very unbecoming because we are not we are no people to tone down what the Quran has actually said. What all we are trying to do is trying to set the Quran its proper perspective. Yes, the Quran deals with bloodshed. Yes, it deals with a lot of things which. Uh, which, so to speak, if we read those things without our believing self in our, own, in, our, in, our, in our own intent, we do have this question that why is it that, for example, uh, we should not pray for the forgiveness of non-Muslims? Why is that? Why is the Almighty so harsh? After all, he's, he's a person who would like the maximum number of people to go to paradise. And why has he stopped us from, for, from praying? I remember just a small incident. Uh, this was many years ago, I think. It was the World Cup, uh, uh, which Pakistan uh, badly lost. I think it was, in, uh, it, it was the World Cup in which Bob Woolmer uh, lost his life. and still a mystery how he lost his life. So when the Pakistani team came back to Lahore, to Pakistan, so they had a service in the church for Bob Woolmer because he had passed away. And I remember, except for Yusuf Yohanna, who was still a Christian at that time, he actually went 
and uh, offered his, his prayers. All the Pakistani team was standing outside the church premises and uh, of course, understandably, when they were asked, they were said that we are not allowed to pray for the forgiveness of a non-Muslim and hence we can only show our solidarity or our, our sympathy, but we cannot pray. So, of course, the question was asked at that time and it still exists in the minds of so many teenagers and youngsters who are cricketers. They ask that why is, that, why is it that we've been stopped from praying for the forgiveness of a person who might be a very righteous person. He might be a person who was seeking the truth and the truth eluded him. And maybe he, he had some excuse. And why are we so harsh? So the point that I'm trying to make is that when we read the Quran, we need to understand that these verses specifically address those non-Muslims of the times of the prophetic era who had intentionally denied, whose intentional denial has, had been actually divulged by the, by the Almighty to the prophets of God. And we just cannot hold the Jews and the Christians of today to be analogous or the same. Uh, they might have the same beliefs. So the beliefs are, might be the same, or in fact they are the same, but the way that we need to deal with them is not the same. We need to understand them, we need to deal with them as if they are any, any human beings. Uh, for example, social intermingling or uh, wishing them uh, their, in their functions and going to them or inviting them over is like, is like a normal thing should, to us. And on a similar note, if you, if you read the Hadith also, you will find that in pursuance of this Quranic uh, uh, intention in which it is said that you have to be harsh to these non-believers, you will find the Prophet himself showing this harshness at a number of times. For example, uh, he actually stopped uh, Muslims from saying salam to non-Muslims. And uh, there was a time in Mecca when this, is not, this never happened. He, he used to say salam to non-Muslims and to, to the mushrikun, but in a certain point of time he stopped doing so and he also stopped the Muslims. But is it the same that we stop saying salam to non-Muslims of today? No, because these non-Muslims to whom we had been stopped in the times of the era of the Prophet to, stay, to, to not say Salaam were the ones who had intentionally denied, they were condemned by the Almighty and as a result of this condemnation there were a number of other punishments also which were given to them which included apostasy, which included some other uh, things which of course we can discuss later on. But the point that is being made here is that we need to understand that the society that we live, the world that we live in today, in fact, it's a global fraternity. From the post-prophetic era, as soon as that era started from the departure or the demise of our prophet until the day of judgment, this now is not the same era in which prophets of God are going to come. Hence, the principles of the first era are not going to apply uh, uh, exactly in the same manner as they did before. Today, we live amongst our non-Muslim fraternity as, as part of their own entities, as part of them. And hence, we need to understand them and they need to understand us. And I often say that this interfaith dialogue, if it is to take place in this post-prophetic era, it has to be a two-way traffic. What happens is that this interfaith dialogue, whenever it starts off, the objective of every Muslim is to convert a non-Muslim into his own religion or her own religion. This should not be a, the objective. Of course, the objective should be to present what you think it as right, but to forcefully convert other people or to condemn them for not converting is not the right approach and and this approach has actually developed because of not understanding that first era or the directives of that first era and we are actually sort of extrapolating those directives pulling on those directives of the first era and trying to apply them in this second era so this is the second part uh, I don't know how much time I have I can go on so the last thing that I'd like to make here is so we've discussed two, two aspects. The first aspect was the genre of the Quran. It's a book of dialogues and hence the dialogues were real between real time entities. Secondly, the theme of the Quran is this preservation of the life of the Prophet or the last Prophet in which he delivered this warning to the ultimate extent to people who were his addresses, real time addresses. And when they denied, by the way, the, 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 the nation of the Prophet never denied. Most of them accepted faith. So you, you can see that the ultimate never happened in, in the case of the Prophet Muhammad. It did happen in the case of the earlier Prophets. But in the case of the Prophet Muhammad, ultimately, you, you know that his own nation mostly accepted faith, barring a few people. So for them, the law, of course, was that uh, they had to be subjected to a certain, uh, a certain risk for us. So this is how we have to understand the Quran. Because our approach towards the Quran has to be an approach in which we are able to understand why is it that the Almighty is angry on certain people and why is it that he is 
not angry on other, other people or is rewards other, or certain people. So this is how we explain. If we understand the theme of the Quran, you will come to know that that theme revolves around a particular set of people. And I am by, in, my, in my own discourse, I am in no way limiting the Quran by telling or by uh, giving this, uh, for example, uh, this, this, this postulate that the Quran is a localized book of God and it has no relevance today. No, that's not, that's not, in, not at all the objective of my whole discourse. What we are trying to do is place the Quran. There are universal verses in the Quran. There are verses which relate uh, directly to all of us. But this particular law of the Quran, which relates just to the messengers of God, it cannot be stretched into this, that second era. And if we do so, we'll be guilty of a lot of blemishes. And uh, you can clearly see that we are guilty of those blemishes. The third and the last part that I'd like to perhaps present uh, before you as a statute uh, to the introduction of, of the book of God is that the Quran has a structure also. It has a format. Now, when we received the Quran from the Prophet, it was a bunch of verses. And uh, it was, of course, uh, uh, the written Quran that the Sahaba had neither had any rukus nor it had verse, nu verse numbers. Uh, it was just a piece of writing written on parchment uh, or on other pieces. And the Quran that later on developed actually passed through various phases. So my third uh, part of my discussion is to make the structure of the Quran more comprehensible and more uh, user friendly towards people who read, read the Quran. So it's more reader friendly uh, in when you pick up the Quran the next time. So as I said earlier on that the structure of the Quran uh, is not something that we are very used to. It's not a book which has a headings. The only thing that we have in the Quran uh, when we received it from the Prophet is that we received 114 surahs, which of course make up the Quran, from Surah Al-Ham to Surah al nas So it, in this sequence, we received the Quran. Now, because of the fact that we believe that the Quran was divinely arranged by the, by the Almighty, is there a wisdom? Is there some hikmah in this arrangement? Because the general consensus is that the way the Quran is sequentially uh, divided and the way it is uh, presented to us is such that the longer surahs occur, earlier on and then we have the shorter ones and ultimately as we go along in the final uh, separas of the Quran we have the very shorter ones. So the general approach towards the structure and the format of the Quran is then the longer surahs are placed earlier on and as we move along in the Quran the shorter ones slowly come into play and then we have the very short ones at the end. Now if you minutely look at this premise you'll find that it is actually an oversimplification and not only is it an oversimplification it is in fact erroneous also because it's not that the longer surahs, all of them are placed in the beginning. We have longer ones in the middle as well. And we have longer ones when we go towards the two thirds of the Quran as well. So it's, it's not a very accurate uh, presentation that uh, the format of the Quran is that the longer surahs come first and the shorter ones come later on. In this regard, I'd like to introduce you to a seminal uh, research which was uh, actually presented by my teacher's teacher, if you know his name, Amin Esad Islahi, uh, he's, the, he's the one who wrote the uh, exegesis of the Quran in Urdu by the name of the Dabari Quran. It's available in Urdu. Parts of it are also available in English. So he said that as far as the structure of the Quran is concerned, the Quran itself speaks about it. We don't have to go to anything else. We don't have to postulate our own selves. We don't need to make uh, these hypothetical guesses that what is the structure of the Quran. He actually said that there is a verse in Surah Hijr, uh, to be exact, it's verse 87 of the 15th Surah, which actually sheds light on this, this structure of the Quran. And why is it important to understand that verse? It is important so that we can have a, a direct uh, or, and a more closer uh, formatting of the Quran itself, so that when we pick up the Quran, we are able to understand how the discourse proceeds within the Quran. He says that the Quran actually say that in, in one in one uh, one of the verses that laqad wa laqad atainaka sab'am min al-masani wal quran al azim which means oh prophet we gave you these seven of two each and this this is a very very concise translation i'm just going to explain it but the literal translation is that seven things which occur in pairs there are these seven things i gave you which occur in pairs which is the quran the great quran wal quran al azim and uh, keeping in view this quranic verse Ustaz Amin Hassan Islai actually uh, came up uh, with this uh, 
with this, with this phenomenal research, of course, it can be debated and uh, can be discussed. And that is that the Quran actually consists, all of us know by heart. And we are so amazed when we see the similarity between two surahs that it once occurs to us that they are very close to each other. They are like twins, they are like pairs. Similarly, Surah Baqarah and Ali Imran, if you read through them, you'll find out the similarity is so uh, uncanny. For example, uh, Surah Baqarah deals with all the crimes which perhaps the Jews did in their times. And Surah Ali Imran, which is its twin surah, actually deals on the same account with the Christians. So the first deals with the Jews and the second with the Christians. And if you go a little deeper, you'll find out that each paired surah has some affinity, some harmony, some correspondence between each other. So these seven chapters of the Quran, he, uh, as, as we call them, and within each chapter, the surahs occur in pairs, has some other distinctions as well. Thus, for example, within the Quranic chapter, the sequence of the surahs is always chronological. It's always historical, which means that the surah which occurs first was revealed the first. So Baqarah was before Ali Imran, Ali Imran was before Nisa, Nisa was before Maida, within a group. But as soon as the next group starts, the, again, the, the, the sequence is historical. And the nature of this historical sequence is such that the Quran, each chapter of the Quran begins with one Meccan, one or more Meccan surahs and ends on one or more Madinan surahs. And as I said, that within a chapter, the sequence of the surahs is chronological, it's historical. The surah which occurs first was revealed first as well. And also within each chapter, you'll find that this prophetic mission or this theme of the Quran, which we just discussed a, couple, a while ago, is embedded in each chapter in some form or the other. At times, it's just the Meccan period. At times, it's half the Meccan period and the Medinan period. At times, it's a very short Medinan period. So you'll find that in each of these seven chapters, the whole uh, mission of the Prophet, which was, of course, to convey the truth in its ultimate form to his adversaries, is enshrined in some format or the other, in some part or the other, so that these seven chapters make a complete whole in some part. So I've, I've been brief here because uh, it needs some more technicalities, but, but just to give you this example that when you pick up the Quran and you, you find that it's divided by the Almighty into these seven chapters, such that each of these seven chapters has surahs which occur in prayers. There are exceptions when this prayer phenomena is broken, very, very few of them, but by and large, you'll find that surahs within a chapter, they exist in pairs, and uh, each chapter starts off with the Meccan surah and ends on a Medinan surah. This is, this is the feature of every chapter. And each chapter has a theme. And that theme actually adds up to the whole theme of the Quran. So the seven chapters having those seven sub-themes, if you add up those seven sub-themes, you'll ha have the complete theme of the Quran, which is the deliverance of warning by the, the last prophet of God to his nation so that it can become a reminder for all of us that this reward and punishment which took place in the times, in his times, is going to take place one day for us who live in the post-prophetic era in the hereafter. So this was a very uh, brief introduction, uh, dear participants. I, I'm sorry if I bored you because there was something technical as well and there were some things which were perhaps new to you. Just to recap, we have studied or introduced the Quran in three areas, the yonder of the Quran, the theme of the Quran, and the structure of the Quran. Of course, I have been brief. I have uh, uh, not given you perhaps enough examples for want of time. But because we have a publication on this subject, uh, you can read through that. And uh, that uh, can be perhaps more illustrative. My purpose here was not to give you a, a detailed uh, lecture, but rather to point at some of the main areas that are very essential, that when you pick up the Quran today, when you start reading it today, or when you hand it over to your young son or your daughter or maybe a non-Muslim, then he or she should be given a prior introduction to what the book is all about. Just handing over the book is not going to make much sense, I'm afraid, although it still has its effects, although people still change, but it, it can be much more systematic, it can be much more effective if we give that small introduction. I think I brought a copy of it. Uh, I think I have it here. So that small introduction is meant for non-Muslims. It, it is meant for your young teenage children. It is meant for our own selves as well who would like to rediscover and uh, revisit how the Quran that we read every day. And at times, we, uh, as I said, we have these questions, but we just put them to sleep. So uh, with these words, I'll just end my talk here. And uh, thank you for all your patience in listening to me. And uh, I invite you, if you have any questions, I would be very glad to answer them.
the words there in the reading them and when we can when we can and in terms of the whole surah and then right. in terms of the data. So I think um, this is a very basic question and it's extremely important that whenever you read the Quran, uh, the Quran is not a book of quotations. So a book of quotation could be a book in which you don't need to look at the previous quotation. It's each quotation or each verse, so to speak, is a new verse. But the Quran is a connected book. It's a, it's a book which was meaningfully compiled by the Almighty through his last prophet. And when the Almighty, of course, compiles something or gives us something, it has to have some meaning. Let me give you a very small example how things get out of hand or they just have a new meaning when we don't give this context its proper weightage. Now, there is a verse in the Quran uh, which says, and it occurs in Surah Anam, uh, the sixth Surah, 38th verse, it says, Ma farratna fil kitab min uh, If I don't let you know what the previous and the next verse is, simply translated, this verse means, uh, the Almighty is saying, Ma farratna fil kitab min shay. I have not left out anything from this book. Which would mean that all disciplines of knowledge are in this book. So this verse has generally been interpreted. If you pick up, pick up for example, uh, Sciences of the Quran books, you'll find out people saying that every knowledge discipline has its spaces in the Quran. Why? Because the Almighty has said, I have not left out anything from the Quran. And you'll find people, I'm not talking about ordinary people, I'm talking about scholars. They would say that, that disciplines like gardening, disciplines like going to the moon, or things like very ordinary things, you'll find some guidance in the Quran and then they stretch Quranic verses to, to get that guidance, which of course is not there. Now place this verse in its context and it has an entirely different meaning. The verse in context is that the previous verses are telling uh, mankind or us that the Almighty has uh, given you all the arguments which are necessary to prove monotheism, to validate mo monotheism. So Tawheed is something which the Quran has given complete explanation of. And when this, these words are said, the next verse is Ma farratna fil kitab min shay, referring to the fact that as far as Tawheed is concerned, the Almighty has not left out any argument that would convince you people. So if placed in its proper context, the verse has a very different meaning. It refers to the Tawheed arguments which are found in the Quran. If you sever the context, it would mean that nothing is left out from the Quran and then all kinds of things. And this is actually the mindset of today's scholars that they derive everything from the Quran and without realizing that this verse actually is referring to Tawheed because that was what was being discussed just prior to this verse. And by disregarding it, we have come to this conclusion. Another important, uh, another example because the question is very significant, is that uh, there is this verse in the Quran uh, which says that inna hazi ummatukum ummatum wahida, which says that this ummah of yours is one ummah, which in other words gave this message to a lot of people who did not look at this verse in its context that we have to exist as a single political entity. In other words, United Islamic States or proponents of pan-Islamism thought that because this Quranic verse tells us in Nahazi Ummatukum, Ummatum Wahida. You are one nation. Your Muslim people are one Ummah. They said this Quran is telling us that we must become one Ummah. And hence we have we should have one caliph. And we must unite under his leadership. And all the Muslim countries, well, today there are about 55 of them, are all dispersed on the globe. They should have one, they should become one unit. And when we place this this uh, surah, uh, this verse in its context, again you'll find a very different picture. Just prior to this verse is a whole sequence of verses, a whole series of verses which tells us that the Almighty sent Noah, He sent Adam, uh, He sent Abraham, He sent Moses, He sent Jesus, He sent all of the prophets and He sent them with the same message. All prophets of God came with the same message and then referring to these prophets of God, the Quran says, in the Hazihi Ummatukum, these prophets of God are one nation or they are one ummah because they brought the same message. So you can clearly see how things change when you, you sever the context. In one, in one part, you'll, just, you'll derive this directive that we are being told that we should become one ummah. And if you place it in context, you'll, you'll get to know that all the Almighty is telling us is that all the prophets of God brought the same religion. They are the same ummah in this regard. There was no difference in their guidance. So it's a historical fact that is being put towards us. But if we sever the context,
we find this new meaning into, into the, this verse. I've just given you two very basic examples. There are so many numerous examples in this case uh, which tell us that by simply not thinking that this Quranic verse does not occur in isolation. It occurs amongst a group of verses. It occurs in a surah which has a theme, which has a subject. And there is something which is going on. If you pluck that verse from the context, you are bound to end up in all sorts of different interpretations. And allow me to say, this is what has actually happened. Today, a lot of difference of opinion that occurs in our ummah regarding the Quran, regarding the Quran, not any other thing, regarding the Quran itself, is because we have severed a lot of verses of the Quran from their context and given independent meanings or assigned independent meanings to that Quranic verse. So, um, my question is um, about your talk. about your talk uh, on the theme of the Quran. Um, so you mentioned two eras. It's, it's very important to understand that. But the prophetic era and then the era after the Prophet Muhammad mm -hmm. passed away. Mm -hmm. And the teaching of uh, all the prophets <coughs> applies to the nations like the lives mm -hmm. of the at the time. Mm -hmm. And the punishment applies to them. All those... Um, I just want to understand that how... Um, all your research, what you what you explain and what you drive the information from, mm -hmm. is this based on any of the s signals coming from any of the verse of Quran? Yes. Or any mm -hmm. uh, hadith? Mm -hmm. Or it's just like overall mm -hmm. and then it's, it's mm -hmm. a human interpretation? Right. So, uh, because of the fact that I had a very limited time, uh, otherwise I, would, I could have shown you that uh, it's just a question of reading the Quran once again and uh, revisiting some of the interpretations. You'll find out that Whenever you read about the old nations, this is a fact, that the Ad and the Samud and the people of Lot and the people of Shoaib, the Quran tells us that the prophet, the prophet was sent to them, he delivered his message to them, he was like a brother to them, he convinced, tried to convince them, and when they denied them, you see the Quran says, Mimbardi ma tabayyana lahumul haq, which is a, which is a Quranic verse, which is, which occurs in the stories of all the prophets of God, which means, Mimbardi ma tabayyana lahumul haq means, after they were convinced what the truth was. After the truth became evident to them and they still denied. So this is something which occurs in the theme of every denial of the messages of God, that they were convinced that he's a messenger of God, he has come from God, he is telling them to avoid certain things and adopt certain things, and out of their own arrogance, out of their own vested interest, they said, I'm not going to believe in you because of the fact that you were not amongst us, or etc., etc. So the Quran, it makes it very clear that this denial was the denial of the Prophet once it had become evident to them. It's not that they were left in any confusion. As I said, it could be the case today. Today the confusion can exist because we are not prophets of God. We, can make, we cannot make things clear enough the way the prophets of God did. And we don't have God on our backing the way prophets of God had. So with the, at, with the help of God, they delivered the truth in its ultimate form. This is what the Quran says that the truth was delivered to the, to, the, to the nations of the Prophet and the words are so that they are left with no excuse against God. So the Quranic words are extremely uh, clear that these Prophets of God, these messengers of God, they, they, they actually delivered the right, the right message in such a clear way that the addressees were left in no confusion. It was not any question that they had in mind. Otherwise, the Almighty would never have punished them. It was when they were clear that it was the right thing and they still said that we will not accept it. So these words, means after the truth became evident to them. After the truth became evident to them. So this was what occurred in the times of the, of the, of the first era. It, it may occur even today. I mean, there could be non-Muslims who are absolutely aware and they are still denying. But I have no means to know which of them are. In the times of the prophetic period, it was God himself because he knows what is in the hearts. He told his messengers that now you have delivered your message to such an extent that everything has been conveyed to them. They are just now dilly-dallying. They are just now avoiding. 
But today, because God has chosen not to communicate to us the way he used to to his own prophets, today we cannot know whether a particular Muslim is intentionally denying or he has a confusion. But if you, if you ask me, I would say that today a lot of non-Muslims are not denying intentionally. Because I, I'm sure you must come across a lot of non-Muslims here. I do come across them in the last 30 years that I've been working. A lot of questions plague them. It's not that they are absolutely clear about the message and they say we reject it. Nine out of, out of ten times the issue is that they have genuine questions. They ask us that why is it that you start killing people in the name of God? Why is it that uh, your prophet, I'm just giving you the examples that they would say. Why is it that your prophet married a seven-year-old uh, girl? Why is it that you don't do certain things? Why is it you punish people by stoning them to death? Why is it that you flog and uh, lash people? So they have a lot of questions. And uh, I can say out of my own humble uh, assessment that we Muslims have actually failed to intellectually convince them or give them plausible answers. All that we tell them is either we snub them, we don't face their questions, or we give them illogical answers, not convincing answers, and then we still expect that they should be people who believe in, in the Quran. So I think today if we are in an a even more greater trial than Muslims were in the times of the prophets of God. Because today, when we go to God, whenever we meet him, he'll ask not only us for what we did, he'll also ask us that what we did led other people to disbelief even further. Led them away from Islam even further because of what we are doing in our own capacities. So I think that today we need to understand that our non-Muslim brethren, I, always, I, I was uh, speaking at MIT and Harvard just the last week, and I was actually trying to make, make this uh, point to them that we are human beings first, and then Muslims or Christians or Jews or Hindus. So we need to understand that our first bond is humanity. Our first connection or our first religion is humanity. We come in this everlasting bond. And when we are born, we are named as Hindus or Christians by our parents, not by our own choice. So if you take a newborn baby, he, he's, he's just a human being. So the first ties that we have with each other is that of a, of a human being. And hence, those ties have to be respected. We have to respect people, you know, if we have to want ourselves to be respected. And unfortunately, this is one point and this is one area in Muslim uh, scholarship which actually is responsible of drawing us away from each other, of actually killing ourselves amongst ourselves and also giving the world and the rest of the non-Muslim world this, this excuse which they can present before God in the hereafter that look, look at these people and look at the way they are presenting what you actually wanted us to, uh, to, to, to understand. And I as a person really think that after 9-11, we have this golden chance which we are wasting every day to actually bring people closer, to tell them that we are one fraternity, we are human beings, we belong to the one human family. And we have to sit together and also agree to disagree. Because there are a lot of things, if you read the Quran, you'll find out that the Quran at a number of places says, uh, which means that there are a lot of differences which you will not be able to resolve. The Almighty is going to resolve them on the Day of Judgment. So let us leave our differences for the Almighty to ultimately decide. Because not only is He going to decide between our differences, but our fate as well. So instead of pronouncing each other as non-Muslims or unacceptable, I think our duty in the light of the Quran today is to present the message that we have understood in a very humble way, in a way in which we can bring people together and let God be their judge. So, the people who have denied the last prophet. How many people? Now, our attitude towards them is really, really harsh. And they're really working with great work here in the United States. It really bothers them. So, in, that, in your words, they're human. They're Absolutely. Human. You see, uh, whether they are Ahmadis, whether they are Ismailis, and whether they are other people who have gone further and who might be deviant, who, who, who differ with the Lord. But as human beings, we do not have the right to call any person as non-Muslim. This is another thing which we need to understand. The Quran has not given anyone except God himself or the Prophet 
to call anyone as a non-Muslim. We have absolutely no business to call any person a non-Muslim if he himself thinks that he's a Muslim. Of course, people who profess non-Muslim as themselves, they are, they are non-Muslims. But as long as a person regards himself or herself as Muslim, we have no right to, to do otherwise. And in Pakistan, if you're specifically referring to the milieu which exists in Pakistan, the way they are persecuted there and the way they are, uh, I mean, it's just such a pity that uh, the way they are killed and the way, the way they are uh, badly treated is absolutely uncalled for. And I am absolutely sure that had the Prophet been alive today, he would have been ashamed of what we are doing. So our business is to call them to what we think is right. Our business is to present in a humble way what we think is right. But what business is it, is it that we stop them from going to the mosque? Or we stop them from praying? Or we stop them from saying that you cannot uh, uh, deliver the kalma the way we do? So this has to be uh, absolutely clarified amongst us that there is no single verse in the Quran which gives any person the authority to call another person as non-Muslim as long as he or she thinks that he is a Muslim. The, this authority rested with the Prophet only and with the Almighty. After that, we do not have that. My second question, my second question is LGBT. We right. inherently think that they're going mm -hmm. to go to hell mm -hmm. because of the way they have chosen the lifestyle. And within our communities, we have a huge reservation right. for those communities. Mm -hmm. I don't think any LGBT would be allowed to come to the masjid mm -hmm. after he is declared right. as such. Mm -hmm. So again, my humble opinion here would be very similar that LGBTQ, they are, they are human beings, they are deviant human beings, we might not agree with what they are doing, but we have to respect them as human beings. I know people of that community who pray five times a day, who fast, who do all other things except for their queer uh, or their different orient sexual orientation. Other than that, they are very good practicing Muslims. By the way, I don't know whether you know or not, in Montreal, we have a mosque. It's, gay. it's, it's a declared gay mosque and people uh, are, the, the Imam is gay and he says that uh, he's, he welcomes people who are gay to pray there. Anyway, that was besides the point. But the real point is that whether they belong to the LGBTQ community or any other community, that is between him and his God or her God. God is going to decide. As far as we are concerned, we should not cut off our relations with them because we don't know their orientation, the way it is in, in present times how perhaps it can be even reformed or changed or maybe we can influence them in a positive way. We have to acknowledge their good attributes. We have to be comfortable with them as we are in any other, with any other community. Of course, our upbringing is such that our own parents and our own minds are averse to them as if they are, they are untouchables. So I think we have to change our mindset and we have to regard each person to be a creature of God and also regard that person as someone whose fate is going to be judged by God, not by us. And as far as they're going to hellfire is concerned, again, we have to make this point that they're going to go to hellfire only if they intentionally had denied a truth. So we don't know. Maybe there was some deformity. Maybe there was some, something which led them or made them such a per pervert in nature. Again, let God decide about them. We must not regard them to be analogous with the community of the prophet Lot, because you see, the the, the crime of the prophet, of the people of the prophet Lot was not merely that they were, they were gays or, or lesbians. They had a step ahead and they had denied a prophet of God as well. So besides these ill ways, the thing that made them condemnable even more in the eyes of God was that they intentionally denied a prophet of God. Today, of course, we cannot say the same thing about the LGBT community. So I often get to talk to uh, young parents, mothers uh, here in the US and Canada, in Australia, in the UK. And uh, as you said, rightly said, this problem at a very younger age in class three or class four, it starts to emerge because your younger lot is exposed to teachers, to their own colleagues who have this orientation. And this orientation is actually openly discussed. It's, 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 thing, it's, it's thought to be a normal thing. And because of the fact that we Desi people are generally trained to become averse to them or uh, not go near them, I think that it is here that we need to perhaps revisit our attitude. We need to reform ourselves and we have to regard them to be creatures of God. And I, I'm always reminded of the prophet Jesus in, his, in, in the Bible when he once said, uh, when he saw, uh, when, 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 when the Jews saw Jesus sitting with a lot of people who were bad in character, uh, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees asked him, 
that why are you te teacher why are you sitting with these people they're so rotten people and you know what he said he said I have not come to the righteous I have come to the sinners because the righteous are, 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 are reformed they don't need my guidance I have been not sent for the righteous I've been sent for the sinners and I always think that these are so such sublime words that only a prophet of God could have uttered them he did not condemn them he sat with them and when people objected he said I'm sent for these people and I think we should take cue from this that instead of shunning people instead of avoiding them instead of uh, labeling them or isolating ourselves from them it is much better to be humble and interact with them and at the same time realize that if they have a deviant attitude in a particular area what about our own selves are we very pious don't we have a lot of shortcomings don't we do some don't we lie I mean if they are sexually deviant what about us there could be a number of things that we are doing wrong uh, and not realizing and just labeling the other person so I think another thing that we Muslims need to do is stop judging people and if we are very fond of judging let it be our own selves because in the case of other people we don't have the data we don't know how the person is from inside but as far as my own self is concerned I know who I am and if I have to I always I always try to make this point that we have these telescopes in which we are trying to pick faults and, and mistakes of other people let's turn that telescope inwards it's just a question of picking your own faults and trying to become a better individual so what is going to what's going what are you going to gain by condemning other people uh, if at all you're to gain something it is by correcting your own self so forget about the flaws of other people concentrate on our own flaws so right 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 so uh, in the Quran in Surah Tawbah and in the case of Prophet Abraham also we know uh, that the, the Prophet was stopped and he said that you should not stand, stand on their graves and and la tastaghfir lahum and do not ask for their forgiveness again these are the idolaters which had been condemned by the Almighty because they were convinced in their hearts that God is one and in spite of the fact they were convinced of the unity of God they did not accept that so it was as a punishment the, the Almighty it was the Almighty remember it's not the Almighty telling us it was the Almighty conveying to his prophet that don't stand at their graves because they have denied me after being convinced that I am one so as a punishment I'm not going to allow you to pray for their forgiveness is this the case with us as well of course not we don't know whether a particular non-muslim is denying God out of his own intention or deliberately or not so to us a non-muslim is a person who is worthy of our forgive, of prayer of forgiveness just as our own Muslim person is we have to be equally compassionate is what a prayer you see the prayer is not a is not a order it's not a directive it's just a request to God he's not going to accept our request if it's against justice it's just our small recommendation that God if this person which who is coming to you now if he has any legitimate excuse please grant him forgiveness that's all it's just a request for forgiveness it's nothing else it's not going to change matters if justice demands something else so we have to pray because of the fact that today's non-muslims as I said are not the same non-muslims of the times of the Prophet for them it was condemnation for them it was a punishment because of the fact that it was the Almighty telling the Prophet that this particular non-muslim or this particular set of non-muslims are people who had who have no reservations they have no confusions they have they are deliberate denier they're arrogant people they are like Satan about whom the Quran says Abba was takbara he denied and he showed arrogance so these were the people whose arrogance was conveyed to the prophets of God uh, by God himself and as I said in this in the post prophetic era this is no longer the case in the post prophetic era we cannot have this knowledge Mm-hmm. How everything was organized, okay, 
how do we know that if we organize correctly? Mm -hmm. First, this is a question in our mind that during the life of our Prophet was there a one complete comprehensive Quran existed at that time or mm -hmm. after that? Mm -hmm. So in terms of like order of surah, everything, how mm -hmm. this all right. came together? Yes. Right. So uh, the, the simple answer to this is that the Quran received by the Prophet was in its oral format. Gabriel or, or the Almighty never sent down a written Quran. It was that orality which existed in Arabia and which was very common in Arabia. If you look at the history of the Arabs, uh, in fact the history of the world was such that there was an era in which orality or oral culture prevailed and written culture was in fact disdained upon because they thought that they have very short memories and they need the services of a writer to preserve uh, whatever content they need to preserve. So they would look down upon writing. So Arabs had their own pride and it's not just the Arabs. If you look at other uh, civilizations, there was this oral culture which prevailed in, the, in, in, those, in those, those times. Thus, for example, you, you, you would come to know that a uh, person like Abu Bakr, he, was, he had a very sharp memory and he was a, uh, he was a very competent uh, gene uh, person who actually had the genealogies of the tribes in his mind. He could narrate to you who was the son of whom right up, up to the prophet Adam at times. So this was something which was prevalent in Arabia. And in a very similar way, the Quran was primarily transferred to the Sahaba and the Sahaba did so to the next generation in its oral form. They, thousands and thousands of them memorized the Quran and revised the Quran and so did the Prophet in front of them and they transferred the Quran orally and that process is still continuing. Even today a Hafiz is needed to certify whether the written copy of the Quran is correct or not. So the written Quran is always something of the secondary nature in which the secondary Quran or the written Quran actually followed whatever was memorized. And as far as the first written copy of the Quran is concerned, nothing can be said of it in certain terms. This, this has been my subject for the last 15 years. I have been researching on the history of the Quran. And I can tell you out of my own humble uh, undertakings that uh, no single era can be singled out in which we can tell that the first written Quran of the nature of a public uh, or, or, a, or a, a something which was done by the state itself uh, materialized. The Quran was transferred uh, to thousands of companions and they transferred it to their own students in its oral form. Of course, the people who had them in their mind, they wrote it down as well. But remember that initially that written Quran was of little use because it did not have the declensions or the Arab. And unless you are a Hafiz, you could not have read the Quran because the Quran can be read variously. And the only single recitation of the Quran, which is the real recitation, could only have been preserved if you are a Hafiz. Because in the absence of declensions, uh, a person can read it differently. So the written Quran, in the, as long as those declension marks or the diacritics were not inserted, followed that oral orality. It was only in, after 50 or 60 years when we can safely say that the diacritics had been inserted and the Arab had been given, that a person who was a convert or a person who was not an original Arab could read the Quran. So I would say my, my simple answer is that uh, it is this uh, all pervasive nature of this oral transmission which in technical terms is called Tawatur. Tawatur means that a very large number of people transmit a text in such a way that, it's, uh, that it, it, is, it is absolutely certain that they have not colluded on something false. So you see, uh, this is because of the fact that our scholars uh, sanction these variant readings and they say that the Quran can be variously read and uh, for example, if you go to Morocco, uh, if you go to Tangiers, if you go to Tanzania, if you go to uh, Egypt and parts of Sudan, Mauritius, uh, uh, not Mauritius, uh, many other North East uh, African countries and even a place as Hazarmat in Yemen, you'll find a different recension of the Quran because of the fact that today the approach of our scholars is that the Quran was actually read by the Sahaba variously. The same verse was read variously in, in variant terms and that has been sanctioned by the Prophet himself. 
Of course, I do not agree with this proposition and that is actually what led me uh, to devote 15 years of my life uh, to this particular subject. And this is just a summary of uh, what I've written. Uh, the book, uh, the actual book is about to be published. So I took up this challenge or uh, it's not a challenge, it was more of a question that I had in mind that if the Quran is supposed to be preserved the way we have been taught, then why is it that we have 11 countries of the world reading a different Quran? And actually we have five different Qurans today uh, in the Ummah. So 97% of the Qurans are the ones that we are used to, but that we read. And 3% of the Ummah is one which is reading, which has three different Qurans or four different Qurans. And they are being published there and not today. They have been published for the last 12 centuries. So where did they come from and how exactly do we justify that they still exist? So that is a slightly longer topic, uh, but to be very uh, precise, I, I'm sure I'd not be, be in a, a position to, to exactly answer your question because this, this would require a lot of background discussion. But uh, as I said that one of the reasons that they, these Qurans exist is because of, a, because of the fact that there is a hadith of the Prophet which tells us that the Quran was revealed on seven ahruf. So the words are unzir al quran wa la haruf which means that the Quran was revealed on seven ahruf. Fakrahu ma tayassara minhu. You can read on any one of these that you would like. Although the hadith itself is uh, subject to a lot of debate, but one of the interpretations of this hadith is that the Prophet himself allowed the Ummah to read the Quran on various, uh, on, on different uh, variants of the same verse. Thus, just to give you an example, uh, if you, uh, there are so many examples in the Quran, I mean, I have counted more than 2,000 of them, uh, in which words are different. For example, if you go to Morocco, uh, you will read this last part of Surah, uh, Surah Tahrim. It says, وَصَدَّقَتْ بِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّهَا وَكُتُبِهِ وَكَانَتْ مِنَ الْقَانَتِينَ This is how we read it in the Quran. But uh, the Quran which is found in Morocco will have kitab instead of kutub. So there will be a difference between singular and plural. At times there is a difference between verb. At times there is a difference between, uh, between tenses. But uh, on most occasions the meanings are not changed. But they do change in some instances. Thus, for example, uh, the Moroccan Quran, if you read it, you will come to know that you don't need to wash your feet for wuzu. Uh, if you do masa, just, just wipe your hand over your feet, it would be enough. And uh, washing the feet in the first place is not even needed and required. And hence, there are some other uh, differences as well. But as I said, these differences have been created by isolated readings of the Quran, by readings which are not supported through Tawatur, which of course is something which the Quran that we know is supported, but because of the fact that our scholars sanction that the Quran which has been transmitted in the form of Hadith or in the form of a few isolated readings is equally good as the one which has been transmitted through Tawatur. So that is why they hold the Quran which was transmitted by a few individuals and hence does not have that authenticity. Uh, to be equal to the Quran which was transmitted by Tawatur because they say that both have equal status so they actually regard these readings to be admissible. As far as we are concerned uh, we make this point categorically clear that the, the, the Quran that we think is the Quran that was given by the Prophet to us was the one which is supported by this Tawatur by this, by this consensus of a large or a vast majority of people. And whereas this is not the case with us, I, of course I cannot divulge some more details because they would be slightly technical. When I went to Morocco and I studied uh, this whole phenomena there many years ago, uh, I actually discussed it with their scholars, with their contemporary leaders uh, who actually uh, were as sure of the fact that their Quran is equally correct as the one that we read in the subcontinent, that there was, there was no question of any, any exchange taking place. They said that this is also correct and yours is also correct. And I said that how can the two be correct at the same time? So he said that because the Almighty wants us, he wants to give us, give us this variation, it's like a blessing from him and we have to accept it. So when the attitude is such that you regard these differences to be a blessing of God, uh, I, I don't think that uh, much headway can be made to actually uh, combine or make a considered effort to come to a single reading of the Quran. So I have a question and a comment. Well, first of all, I'm a great speech, great talk. Uh, it makes me feel even more stronger as to what I've been you know, believing for a long time that, you know, what was in the Quran was for that time, it really doesn't apply 100%. The it really just cannot. And, but, you know, it's good to hear the way you describe so it, it makes it easier for me to explain to someone else. 
So I think looking at the broader picture here, uh, I'm all for humanity, free religion, that is the number one. But how do we actually make it happen? I don't see it happening. I mean, one way maybe, are you from a modest platform? Are you thinking to talk to other scholars in mainstream, what your teachings are? Maybe more and more people hear about this, they sort of think about this. Otherwise, we are born with a barometer to check how far is Mr. Mm-hmm. Nayas and Mr. Mahmoud and Mr. Jahannam and you know, done that. Right. So, are these other models working something mm-hmm. like that or no? So, uh, we have a very uh, small voice, I can say it's just a a single candle that we've tried to light and uh, all that we can do is do our best and uh, I think that the people who are already involved in in religious circles who are already uh, I mean deeply engaged uh, perhaps they are the ones who are not our direct addressees because that discussing and debating with them is extremely difficult because they have sort of closed their minds so our addressees are the people who would like to debate and discuss and entertain new ideas. We don't say that whatever we say is absolutely correct. What we do claim is that we present whatever we think is correct on the basis of a certain argument or a reasoning. That can be challenged and that can be set right by any person. Uh, and so our, our addressees are people who, would, who, who are not closed, they have not stopped thinking, who are still, uh, who are still used to thinking, and in particular uh, young minds like people in, the, in, in high school, in colleges and universities because I do a lot of uh, work with, the te- with youngsters and teenagers and all over the world and I do get the chance to talk to them and I think that there is a tremendous potential not only in amongst Muslim children but all, amongst all teenagers because they are people who are born in a culture in which the real, uh, the, the tide of time is that you have to understand something in order to believe in it. You just cannot blindly follow things. Uh, this was the culture that we were used to when we were growing up and that culture has now finished all over the world and if you don't understand this we're going to lose our children and in fact we have started to lose our children so I think the the young minds of today they are inquisitive and they are very sharp they are much smarter than we were in, in their ages so if we have the you know, the armor of reasoning with us I was in New York a couple of years ago and I had a sitting with the with, with these some teenagers and they had a lot of questions and one of them was regarding halal food and then they said that why is it why is it Islam so strict that uh, we should eat this food and not that food why is it that we, why why cannot we just say Bismillah Rahman Rahim and eat whatever is, is halal so in my uh, opinion humble opinion I gave them the logic which I found from my teacher and from the, the teacher of my teacher and uh, suddenly I found that the youngsters they said that no one told us the reason all that we were told by our parents is this is halal and this is haram. You do this and you do this. Stop doing this. So you see, as parents, we need to understand that we cannot order our children to do something or to stop doing something. We have to make them understand. We have to tell them why. Why should we pray? Why should we fast? Why should we avoid haram food? So you see, people who wisdom is something which is not just my, my inheritance, not my something which belongs to me. If you explain the wisdom to people around you, uh, it's, it's, it's something they will leap for. Because if you have the right reasoning, if you have the right uh, underlying reason that you can explain to people, this is something they will share with you and they will tell you that this is uh, how we also th- thought. So I think what we need to do today is understand deeply uh, each directive of religion, uh, find out its logical basis and try to communicate that to our younger lot as much as we can because it's if you don't uh, then the all you can do is you can you can f- perhaps put some pressure on them for a f- for a smaller bit of time but that's not going to work as soon as they're out of your sight they're going to do the opposite in a in a much more forceful way and we'll all we'll just end up regretting so i think before we regret too much it's high time that as parents we need to understand that if we have to change the outlook of our younger lot we have to reason it out with them and for this, we must understand the reasoning ourselves first, because you see, the, the lack or the absence of reasoning is, is found in our own selves rather than our children. So we must equip ourselves first. We must educate ourselves first so that we can actually enter into a dialogue with them.
Thank you so much for this talk and thank you Master Bai for arranging this talk. Um, but I may be the only one who speaks, uh, who, who does not speak Urdu here and so I just want to know like uh, al Maulid is doing a great job from what I understand from my friends over here. Um, but a lot of people are looking for uh, in the Muslim world, right? I mean outside of Urdu speaking community, are, are looking for such uh, directions and the leadership in, you know, um, in this particular area. And uh, I, you know, I threw a question, and, and maybe a follow-up question to what Dr. Atif asked, like, you know, um, is uh, al Maulid understanding that and leading uh, or looking into that direction to have more conversation on that area? Another thing is actually, um, I'm more worried about our next generation because mm -hmm. the way we were brought up, Alhamdulillah, for some reason, we have this freedom to think like this, even though mm -hmm. we were set, we were brought, brought up like, do this, don't do this, mm -hmm. um, that kind of uh, separation without give, giving more clarity on why yes or why no. But still, we got this opportunity to live alone with the non-Muslims and understand and respect them. And that's the reason mm -hmm. why most of those who are in this room are here right. and understand this. However, I'm afraid that our, our next generation who are growing up, my kids I'm talking specifically about, they are. They have that kind of a mindset because the masjids, you know, our masjid over here, mm -hmm. uh, or our community over here, when they go there, they, they are being fed with a very narrow-minded uh, mm -hmm. uh, education. Mm -hmm. and they are not getting that. And mm -hmm. what is the best way, you know, right. you know, to open up the horizons for them? So. Uh, we at uh, Al Mora, we recently uh, shifted our uh, head office to Dallas, and uh, my teacher, Ustaz Javed Ahmed Bahamadi, has actually relocated to Dallas. Uh, he shifted there, and uh, the intention is to set up a center of excellence of education uh, in Dallas, which would be online as well as on campus, and it ha it'll have various educational uh, courses for all age groups uh, in English and in Urdu and maybe someday in some of other, uh, the other languages as well, uh, in which the purpose would be to educate people uh, regarding the arguments and the reasoning of why they should believe in certain things and why not, and m let them make their own choice. Instead of imposing our own views on them, our uh, pedagogy or our technique of uh, teaching is that we present arguments in favors of, for example, a couple of opinions, and let the audience or the person make up his own mind and this is what we call academic thinking. So uh, what, what we're trying to set up uh, in, the, in perhaps uh, in this in the remaining part of this year is, is a is a undertaking in which we are able to offer some courses online and uh, on campus. People can come there and of course uh, get educated but that's not easy for so therefore online courses will be offered and uh, the format that we are actually looking at is called a box course. So a box course is a course which is a day-long course. It's a four or five hour course and an exhaustive study of a single subject. For example, uh, if I take up uh, a theme of the Quran. So what, I, what we'll typically do is that we'll have a three or four hour discussion, a chat, maybe tea and breaks and interactive sessions. So a box course is, is designed on various issues, one particular issue, so that an exhaustive study on that issue can take, can take place. And instead of giving people four months or five months, because everyone of us is busy and we just cannot afford a lot of time. So these day-long courses or these box courses are designed so that they can be conducted uh, in various parts of the US. I just conducted one in Dallas. Uh, we have plans to do one in Boston. We can do one in Chicago and um, maybe some others in some other city as well. So the idea is that you are able to participate in one particular topic uh, and uh, when you go home, uh, at least that particular topic is exhaustively clear to you and maybe your own children as well. So our modus operandi is basically that through these box courses we are able to uh, find a place in the academia of, of the United States slowly and as, as people come more closely uh, associated to us we can have a longer format of teaching as well. But to start off uh, the import is on that box course. Actually, I have two follow-up questions. The discussion has totally changed to different areas, so it was okay if I can take it back to the two questions. There are two questions sure. in my mind, yeah. which I want to clear, I want to take an opportunity to just mm -hmm. talk. Um, again, I'm going back to the follow-up question of my original question. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned like there's no way we can judge from the same mm -hmm. uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, the area, profit, and right. the secondary example. So 
there are few things which are clear, which I think it's a clear cut mm. if I'm wrong. Mm. So if a person is a Muslim, and I'm just talking about a real situation, mm -hmm. I know there's a real situation mm -hmm. in that context. If a person is Muslim and decided not to be a Muslim, okay. they decided to leave Islam. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is the guy actually, I have a friend who's in a situation, mm -hmm. and he told me like, um, if I live in Pakistan, I will be killed mm -hmm. by law. Right. So this is the law. So here, what's the take here? Um, now here we are clear, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. we know he's, he was Muslim, we know he's committing a no more Muslim, mm -hmm. and things are clear here. So can you punish? Oh, well, I, I understand. Punish or are we allowed to punish? Are we judged? Mm -hmm. He's saying yes, I'm not saying no. So you see, uh, the Quran itself has answered this question. It says, Man sha'a fal yu'min, man sha'a fal yakfur. Let a person who would like to believe, let him believe, and let a person who would not like to believe, not believe. We are no one to decide. Had we been living in the era of the Prophet, of course that would have been a matter and the Prophet would have called him up and discussed with him and maybe uh, things would have reached this, this uh, extent that he would be convinced and he would have still been denying. That would be another thing. But in today's era, in which a person says that I no longer would like to remain a Muslim, it's his choice. We cannot punish him. We cannot rebuke him. Of course we can discuss it with him. We can have an exchange with him. We can maybe find out what has made him make this choice because more often than not it is the wrong attitude of the clergy or our religious people which make people reactionary and make them leave the fold of Islam. So we can have a discussion but at the end of the day if a person wishes to leave Islam for whatever reason that he or she might want to, he or she is absolutely open to as per the Quran. Of course what the Almighty will do with him on the day of judgment is something between he and, and the Almighty. But today, we cannot pass any verdict against him, and we should not. And we should respect his, his, uh, his views or her views and, uh, and, and let him be. And the only thing that we can do is, as I said, engage him or her in a meaningful dialogue, which maybe uh, could tell us the reason. Because you see, this does not happen. I have seen this taken, taking place, but in most cases, it takes place because of some reaction which the person has against it religion and that reaction is because of the fact that he has been mishandled by people around him. So again, follow up question, um, the people who believe he should be killed, why they believe? Do they have any... Right. So, so, yeah. so you see what happens is in the, in, the, in the Quran it is told that people who are intentionally denied and they also intentionally deny as polytheists that they should be put to death. You, the, the, the Quranic punishment in the prophetic era was of two types. If people were basically monotheists, like the Jews and the Christians, they were spared. They were told that they, would, they, they could live under the authority of an Islamic state, but because of the fact that they are monotheists, uh, they'll be allowed to live on their own religion, but as subservience and pay jizya. But for the people who are the idolaters or the mushrikun, they were the ones because the Almighty says that I, cannot, I can forgive everything but shirk. I can forgive everything but polytheism. And because you subscribe to polytheism and, but, and because you are convinced that polytheism is wrong and you still follow it, I'll put you to death. So it was actually subscribed or prescribed for the polytheists of Arabia. And that is why by not understanding that that punishment was specifically meant for the idolaters of Arabia, our laws actually at times erroneously extrapolate. They extend that same punishment for those people uh, and implement it for us as well. And by the way, this is exactly what uh, Osama bin Laden and Mullah Omar have in, had in mind. So in 1994, when Osama bin Laden had not become very popular, uh, there is this famous uh, shura which took place in Khost in Afghanistan. And uh, we still have its clippings. Uh, I, don't, I don't know whether they have him or not, or not, but they were there in, formerly on YouTube in which he came out from that shura and he actually uh, he recited a verse of Surah Tawa which, which is Qatilu Ayyamat al-Kufr that kill these uh, the leaders of disbelief and he was referring to the United States he said that I declare war on the United States and I'm going to, I'm going to see them and this was way back in 1994 and you, you, you know what happened about 15-16 years later so you see what has happened is that certain verses of the Quran which belong to the prophetic era in their import were erroneously uh, extrapolated uh, to belong to this era as well. I so I have another question. Sorry, that's a separate, separate subject. It's talking about like uh, Ahmadis as non-Muslims and Muslims. This is my opinion. So correct me if I'm wrong. So 
if you st- if there is another group of people come and uh, they say uh, we will read five ten prayers a day, mm-hmm. but we are Muslims, mm-hmm. there there will be different variation of that. Mm-hmm. So shouldn't we have a very defined boundary that says this as long as you're in the boundary, you're Muslim. I'm not saying we right. mm-hmm. ulama or something. Have very clarity, mm-hmm. and then who's outside mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. should not be declared as Muslim. The purpose of that I'm saying is because whoever is doing that mm-hmm. in this boundary. Do not want to lose their identity. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a legitimate request. Right. I don't want to lose my identity. You do mm-hmm. something other you know, mm-hmm. using the same name as mine. Mm-hmm. I believe this is a correct argument. So correct right. Argument. So you see, uh, we have to go to the Quran and the Almighty because you see, He has created uh, us and He has given us a certain outlook. So He never imposed this restriction. Never. There were people in His times. There were people after His times. And the Quran explicitly argued with them and it said, like Rafid Deen, there is no compulsion in religion. And whoever person wants to believe the way we would like him to believe is free to do that. So the restriction that you're talking about, of course, would have been something which we cannot impose ourselves. It should have been either laid out by the Prophet or by the Almighty himself. And they never did. So in, in the absence of what they never did, I think we should also refrain. And instead of uh, cutting off people from the fold of Islam, uh, we should be actually behaving in the opposite manner. Let them be part of us. There are variations. There are differences of opinion. And who are we to judge other people? Let, God is there. The book of God is there. The book of God is going to converse to them as it is going to converse to us. So let it do its work. And if in spite of reading the book of God, they end up at some other place, you see, God has allowed them this leverage. And you're talking about these people. What about people who are agnostics? What about people who are atheists, who don't even believe in God, who have, who have several other deviations? Even they are allowed to live by the Almighty. So if the Almighty is allowing them to live and choose for themselves, and then he says, once the spirit ends, I'm going to take account from you. So let him take his account. As far as this period of choice is concerned, it is God-given. So something which is God-given should not be I mean, taken away by us. question but I will uh, take it from here that uh, don't we know that uh, God has already defined you know we, we say the Kalma Shahada you know that's the mm-hmm. requirement for mm-hmm. uh, having a faith in, you know having a faith on the finality of mm-hmm. the Salah and if somebody is uh, you know amending to it they are automatically out of this so you see, uh, we need to understand it. Why is that person going out of that belief system? Is it because of arrogance? Is it because he recognizes the prophet to be the prophet of God, the sole prophet of God, and still deviating? If that is not the case, because uh, the Quran says that in the era of the prophet, he does not leave any excuse with the non-Muslims. And they have no confusion. They, are, they know what the truth is and they still deny. But once the prophets of God pass away, uh, the situation changes because the addressees, they, they change. Their beliefs, they look upon us, us Muslims, the way we behave. And a lot of their confusions are because of the fact that we are not clear, clear ourselves. So for the people of the era of the prophets of God, you are absolutely correct. They would have no excuse. But for people who are, belong to the later era, about them, uh, we cannot make any decision because God has left that era open-ended. And he said, for that era, I'm going to take account in the day, on the Day of Judgment. So in that post-prophetic era, if I call it post-prophetic era, the, uh, the whole situation is that people who are not believing could be not believing because of a number of reasons. For example, they could be living in a territory in which the message of Islam never reached them. They are still parts of this world in Amazon, in South America, and in Africa, where people don't even know who the Prophet is, who Prophet Muhammad was. So there could be one excuse that, they would, that the message of Islam has not even reached them. The second could be that it has reached them, but there was no, no one with whom they could discuss it or debate with it or find out more truths about it by discussing them. And then there they they could be these people who had questions, had genuine questions, but the way they were handled or mishandled actually never made them convinced of Islam. So these are the categories which generally exist today. The only category which of course would be held accountable very harshly by the Almighty, even this post-prophetic era, are the ones who found the truths and they still denied it. The only difference is that in the era of the prophets they could be pinpointed because God was pinpointing them. Today they still exist, 
but we cannot pinpoint them because for them we need God to pinpoint them and God only pinpointed them through his prophets and those prophets have stopped coming. So in this post-prophetic era, we cannot pinpoint people who are intentionally denying. So in this post-prophetic era, we have to give the benefit of the doubt to other people. And again, as I said, uh, why should we make a final decision regarding them? This is something which is God's prerogative. It is God's domain. So we have to stick to our domain and Lord, let God do what is in his domain. My original question is that uh, now that you have moved the headquarter to uh, Dallas, mm -hmm. uh, do you still see the same kind of, uh, uh, I would say, denial or rejection of the ideas that you faced in Pakistan with the scholars over here, mainstream, mainstream scholars? I think so, yes, because the mainstream scholars here have come from Pakistan, most of them, and uh, very few of them are born and raised here. Uh, so, as I said earlier on in one of the answers, our main target are not the scholars themselves because they are already engaged in their work. Of course, if they would like to discuss, we are always open uh, for that discussion. But our main target is the younger generation and is the disenchanted Muslim mind, which would like to know the truth and is being denied that truth. And also uh, people who are on the other side who are not Muslims as yet, and people who are fresh converts. So these are the people with whom uh, we intend to in uh, engage into dialogue. As far as people who are already in a particular religious organization or an undertaking, I think that uh, we are always open to talk with them, but it's the other way around. They are not very willing to talk to us. Do you have any publication that is uh, targeted towards new Muslim or? In fact, we have. So we have a book, uh, it's called uh, Concise Introduction to Islam, which is meant for people who are non-Muslims or even younger lot which is growing up and would like to study what exactly Islam is in a very precise way. And uh, we have some other books as well. We have books which relate to professional and personal uh, en enhancement like character building and personality advancement. So there are uh, books available both in the Urdu and the English language. Uh, we have a website, so uh, maybe you can circulate the website. The website has a list of our publications uh, which are available online. And they, they're also available at Amazon and can be ordered uh, and bought as well. And they can be read online as well, some of them. Okay, one final question. Uh, <coughs> the difference in translation between Almoric scholars and other scholars is that, so one part is the, uh, uh, the structure, uh, like how you see the, the whole words and the surah. Other are the individual words. And then you mentioned that the Quran came uh, mm -hmm. in the seventh century. And uh, so that particular word, how it was used, mm -hmm. uh, that's how you, the and mm -hmm. and so forth, had, had, uh, had found the meaning, right? So there is a reference mm -hmm. for the uh, idea of uh, uh, mm -hmm. the, what they call it, literature. Is there a way that Almar is going to publish that on the website so that mm -hmm. other people can say so, what is the difference? Mm -hmm. So actually, uh, we don't need to publish that because a number of websites already have that uh, classical Arabic literature. Uh, it is published in Lebanon, it is published in Egypt, in Sudan, in many Arab countries. And we also have them online, free of cost. You just type the name of that classical collection and you're going to find that on the internet. Uh, almost everything is now available on the internet, but unfortunately it is in Arabic because of the fact that the Quran is in Arabic and if you have to draw something from the Quran regarding parallel literature, it has to be in Arabic. So for that, to reach that extent, you need to have a very, very, very heavy grasp of Arabic. And uh, although it's possible, but it does take about five to seven years to reach to that extent. But as far as the content is concerned, the literature is concerned, it is freely available. You just type the name of the collection, the anthology. It could be an anthology of poetry. It could be an anthology of prose. Just write the name and you'll find it online, free of cost. And the Gutenberg pro project, the famous project uh, which has been going on by Google, in which they are actually putting up these free books uh, for public use, uh, is one of the areas which you can benefit from because they have made this, this classical Arabic literature available and it's just a click away.
Thank you very much.